This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. He's the director of the Center for Brain and Cognitive Sciences at University of California. He's known sometimes to be Sherlock Holmes of the brain, one of the brightest minds working on the workings of the human mind. He's a philosopher, psychiatrist, neurologist, writer, physician, all rolled into one. If I start counting the awards he has won, it'll take too much time, but don't be surprised if he is the next Indian to win the Nobel. Newsweek already lists him among the 100 people to watch in this century. Dr. Ramachandran, welcome to Walk the Talk. Thank you very much, Shekhar. Delighted to be here. It's wonderful to be here at the Theosophical Society. In your hometown of Chennai. And in my hometown of Madras, Chennai. Uh, you can almost feel the presence of Krishnamurti's spirit here. <laughs> it's so <laughs> well, peaceful and... I was, one, you know, since I can't match you in terms of intellect or, or your knowledge of what goes on in the human mind, I thought at least let me find ambience to, <laughs> to match the depth of your mind. Let me also tell you, it, it's a confession, my idea of neurosciences is basically the brufen or the crocin I pop it when I have a headache. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that's not unusual. It's a rapidly growing field. There's been an explosion of ideas and experiments in this field in the last 10 or 15 years. If you go to the annual meeting of the American Society of Neuroscience, you find last year there were 15,000 papers presented in this one meeting. And this gives you some idea of the staggering scale of research in this field. Um, and just to put it in perspective, what's exciting is the fact that if you look at the history of ideas in the last several centuries uh, about, uh, that human beings have had about themselves and their place in the cosmos, you find it's been punctuated by what might be called revolutions, upheavals in thinking. And the most famous of these is, of course, the Copernican Revolution, the fact that right. the Earth is just a little speck of dust in the cosmos. It's not the center of the uh, solar system. The second revolution is the, uh, you can think of it as the, um, the DNA revolution, the idea that there's no vital spirit, that each of us is just a bag of chemicals. At least that's what Watson and Crick claimed, right? But now we are poised for the greatest revolution of all, and that is understanding who we are. Who am I? Hmm. And even if you go back to ancient Hindu philosophy, people talk about Tattva Masi and Am Brahmasmi and all of that. But now we can actually get to the physical basis of consciousness, self-awareness, what it means to be human, because ultimately all your joys, your sorrows, your hopes, your fears, your ambition, even what you think of as your own private self inside you is basically just the neurochemical activity of 100 billion little wisps of jelly in your head, which we call neurons. That's all it is. That's what reality is. It's the activity of these neurons. Could it be that you think that most of the body has now been conquered? The brain is the new fr frontier, mind is the new frontier. Absolutely right. I mean, it, 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 it's amazing that we know so much about, for example, the functions of the liver. Right. Um, we know it secretes bile, it stores glycogen, um, it detoxifies blood from the intestines, the portal blood. You know what two, two shots of single malt whiskey do to it? It can, it can uh, too many shots of whiskey of course, can produce extensive fibrosis and damage. But what I'm saying is we know so much about the liver and we know even the liver has at least 20 or 30 functions, each of which can go wrong. There are so many types of jaundice, for example. But with the brain, we know so little. If there's something wrong, if, if you're thinking, the neurologist, even a trained neurologist will say you've got dementia. All the activities of thought are encompassed in one word, dementia. Right, right. And this can't be right. right. Surely there are dozens and dozens of types of thinking, styles of thinking, many areas of the brain involved. And what's exciting for us is now we can begin to approach these questions empirically uh -huh. by doing research on the brain. Questions like, what do you mean by willing and action? What do you mean by self? What do you mean by seeing red? All of these questions you can begin to answer yes. by looking at the physical structure of the brain. Because you, you have to answer questions like why we laugh, why we remember, why we forget. That's correct. That's correct. Now, until recently, that was not possible. Right. And, and uh, people would say, well, look, let's wait another 200 years or 300 years before we can begin to approach these questions. For example, not long ago, I saw a patient uh, in India who I was just doing a routine neurological testing, taking a needle, checking his sensory systems. Uh, seeing if his pain pathways were intact. So part of this is just to take a needle and poke you and ask you, for example, you're the patient, I say, 
you say, ouch, ouch. You know, normally you, you say it, it hurts. I mean, of course, I do it gently, right. right? And then I test you throughout your body. This patient, every time I poked him, he would start giggling and laughing, saying it feels very funny. And I said, why are you laughing when I'm poking you with a needle? This is the patient in Velour, if I... In Velour, Velour, Velour yeah. yeah. So, this is the ultimate irony, if you think about it, a patient laughing in the face of pain, right? And in a sense, we are all in that predicament. Here is the pain of existence, the pain of the knowledge of certain death, but we're all laughing, you know? So, it's the ultimate paradox. Why would a patient laugh when poked with a needle, but it turns out you can figure out why it happened. When we did a CT, we found here damage in a region called the insula in the brain. I see. Now this region normally receives pain signals, goes to the insula, from there it goes to the emotional core of the brain called the limbic system, from there to the anterior cingulate, and then you say, ow, oh, that's where you experience the agony of pain. Right. Now what happened in this patient was the path, the insula itself is normal, it's not been damaged by the stroke. That's why he can feel the poke of the needle. But the wire that goes from the insula to the limbic structures is damaged. So there's been a disconnection between sensory aspects of pain and your emotional experience of agony. So in other words, even though we think of pain as one thing, it actually has many layers, at least two layers. One is the sensation and the other is the internal experience of emotion, agony. So in this chap, the pain arrives the brain senses the pain, but immediately afterwards you should experience the emotion, but there is no emotion because that wire is cut. So, so, so I, I, as you say, human mind has a mind of its own. That's correct. It can do things unbidden. Mm -hmm.